Good morning, everyone. I'm Vicki Spruill, the president and CEO at the New England Aquarium, and we're here on a very busy morning um, to talk about animal care. And I am so pleased to have with me this morning Mark Smith, who is our vice president for animal care here at the New England Aquarium. We're going to have a conversation for 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, just to talk about why aquariums matter, why aquariums are important, and uh, we want to have a special emphasis today on the care of animals, which um, Mark knows an awful lot about. So I want to start off just by asking you, Mark, um, to tell us a little bit about why you think aquariums are important in the first place. You've um, spent your career leading in various capacities in aquariums all around the world, um, sort of What's so special about this aquarium, and why do you think aquariums matter? Thank you very much, Vicky. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think aquariums actually have a very important place in the urban fabric as a cultural institution. The oceans are, for many people, actually out of reach, and we are passionate about the oceans. We fell in love with the oceans. When you fall in love, you want to tell people about that. And you want to connect them to the oceans in the same way that we've had the opportunity to uh, be connected to the oceans. And to do that, an aquarium is a really good venue. You can bring some of that sense of wonder to a place where people can come safely and engage directly with some of that life from the ocean. And that provides us an incredible opportunity because aquariums engage people at a very visceral, emotional level because of this connection with the animals but also at a, at a cognitive level, that they, we can present information about the oceans and about the animals that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. And the two together is a very powerful mix. And we're very fortunate that this aquarium, from its very inception, was a place for conservation research for almost 50 years now that has been woven into the DNA of the organisation. And uh, we're a really great location to bridge the gap between really hardcore academia and really meaningful, useful solutions to the public with sort of a bridge that brings those, that bridges those two worlds. That's fabulous. You know, one of the questions I get a lot, um, or one of the observations people have is that, you know, it's hard to get into the ocean. It's certainly hard to get deep into the ocean. And while we, people have experiences with all kinds of marine mammals and animals on the surface or on the shore, um, you know, I think aquariums bring the sort of invisible to the visible. So, yeah, I mean, how special is it to be able to see some of these animals up close that you would never, ever, ever in your lifetime have an opportunity to see up close and personal? And so to me, I think that's another, that's another value. We just wouldn't see them any other way. No, you're absolutely right. When you, and it, I think we underappreciate the threshold between the terrestrial world and the ocean world. Yeah. So the surface of the ocean, I mean, it's water, you can put your finger through it, but actually it's a, a real psychological barrier for some people. And of course the ocean is very large. We're actually having an impact as humans on that massive ocean. But you have to travel great distances to see a lot of the things that uh, the ocean actually has. And an aquarium is able to sort of condense those distances and, and break that threshold between the terrestrial and the, and the underwater world. And again, just really bring some of those wonderful experiences right up close to people where they can have an intimate dialogue with the animals and, and really start to value them in a way that they would not be able to value them if they were not seeing them live and up close and personal. Right. It's much harder to care about uh, a species of penguin if you've not even, even ever been in the southern hemisphere and, and certainly not been to their natural ranges. Well, just standing here, and I, uh, I'm not sure if everyone can see this around us, but just watching all the faces of these children and, and adults, frankly, um, observing the penguins that are behind us, watching their interactions, laughing about them, yeah. mimicking them. Um, you know, whenever I have a bad day, I come over here and I just watch them myself. And, uh, and that, again, that interaction is so important. So um, one of your responsibilities, of course, is uh, making all of this work. 
and I have been amazed every day by um, the intricacy of what's involved behind the scenes. So, you know, the public comes and sees all of these beautifully designed exhibits and all these well cared for animals, but I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what it really takes <laughs> to run an aquarium. <laughs> Well, what it takes is a, a large team of talented people. And animal care is about 85 people full-time yeah. and, a, and a, a large group of very dedicated volunteers, over 200 uh, volunteers in some way engaged with animal care. And, um, and then they manage the animals through a whole series of infrastructure that we have to manage water quality. Uh, we have a, an incredibly talented animal health department we have very rigorous biosecurity measures and uh, techniques that we employ to make sure that we are sourcing our animals sustainably. And uh, all of that's just to present the animals to the public. We have an incredible um, in-house uh, fabrication and design team who design the exhibits to meet the exacting needs of the animals and yet present the animals in a, in a way to the public that they can really, uh, again, have that intimate dialogue with the animals. And that's sort of directly working with the animals themselves. The entire staff of the aquarium is dedicated to being able to deliver this to the public. And uh, that includes finance, human resources, I mean, there are all of these departments, facilities, who, who basically make that possible. And uh, so it's, it, it seems like, well, it's like a very large goldfish bowl. So, you know, you clean it once a week and uh, you put the fish back in and it's, you know... It's way more complicated it's than that. much happens. more sophisticated than that. Yeah. And I, I guess one other thing to say is that you have animals from very uh, diverse uh, geographic locations and that implies uh, very different temperature ranges, very different humidity, uh, and so you have to replicate all of those different conditions for uh, each of the groups of animals. So uh, I was actually in a meeting yesterday where someone was commenting about the wonder of the giant ocean tank and how they've been coming for decades, actually, and love making their way up and observing the animals from these different vantage points. And um, the question I got was, do they get along in that ocean tank? <laughs> how do the animals get along? And What's involved in making sure that they do get along, and what happens when they don't? Now, that's an excellent question. So the, our giant ocean tank is what we refer to as a multi-taxa exhibit. In other words, there are dozens and dozens, actually over 100 species in that exhibit. And uh, in nature, many of those species do not get on. Yeah, yeah. You know, some are predators, some are prey, uh, some are antagonistic to others. And that's all part of the natural push and pull of life. Yep. And uh, we have to try and replicate that while having the animals coexist. Right. And so uh, there are a variety of techniques we use. We choose animals very carefully, thoughtfully, uh, that we know can actually coexist together. Um, and sometimes that involves a little bit of experimentation. We're often at the fringes of knowledge. Yep. And so we try a species and we find that doesn't work so well, but maybe a similar species will work uh, well. We also add animals in number that are, uh, again, more harmonious. So it's sort of actually trying to replicate the, the numbers of animals relative to each other uh -huh. or between species that is similar to what you would find in nature. And uh, we obviously keep them very well fed. Um, we have really uh, a really thoughtful nutrition regime for that whole exhibit. And uh, despite all of those possible um, mechanisms to avoid interaction between the animals that we don't want to see, very occasionally one of the animals will eat one of the other animals. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's sad, yeah. but actually it's perfectly natural and um, it's an expected interaction. It's what you would have in nature and we have it in the GOT. I will say much less frequently than you would have in nature, but it does yeah. happen occasionally. Yeah. And just one other technique that we use, uh, which I think people would uh, find interesting, is we use the howdy cage. Oh. <laughs> So the howdy cage is uh, essentially an underwater uh, basket that you put animals into just for the first 24 hours or so, maybe it can be a little bit longer, and they have an opportunity to relax the other animals, interact with them visually and uh, through chemical cues. And when you release them into the exhibit, 
they're much less likely to have a negative interaction than if oh, you just put them in there straight away. That's fabulous. Maybe we need a howdy cage for humans as, oh, we, yes, move we, around, <laughs> as we move around and meet each other in new environments and circumstances. So you talked a little bit about sustainability, uh, and I'm wondering if you could expand on all the many ways we're uh, advancing conservation through the work of the New England Aquarium yeah. and its animal care team. Because, and I'd, I'd love you to focus specifically on how we've actually reared some of the animals that are in the tank and uh, how we take animals from the wild, which some people believe is, is controversial. Yeah. We could fill a whole uh, session on yeah. just that yeah. question. We, yeah. we do so many things. Um, and it's not just the animal care team, it's the other departments, particularly the Anderson Cabot Centre for Ocean Life right. that we uh, work with continuously. But so I'd say closer to home, we do a variety of things. We uh, reproduce a lot of species that we put on display. Not all. Some we collect in the wild. But we're very strategic and thoughtful about what species we want to reproduce here at the aquarium. And we make choices uh, around questions like, uh, does it cost a lot of energy to go and collect that animal? Uh -huh. Obviously, is the animal uh, conservation dependent? So if an animal is critically endangered, we would not go and collect that species. Right. Um, and we then choose species that we know are in high demand uh, for other aquariums and species for which we don't know a lot about their reproductive biology. And we, when we go through the process of breeding animals, we collect all that information and make that available free to other institutions. So we're really learning about the life cycles and habits of these animals we are. through the process of showing them to the public. Yeah, we are a great deal. And uh, just one example, we uh, have a species on display in the giant ocean tank called the Lookdown. And the Lookdown we collect in the Caribbean. And they're called Lookdown because the, their eyes look down. They look down. down. They yeah, really look yeah. like they're looking down. Um, so we collect those in the Caribbean. And we chose to reproduce that species because it costs a lot of energy to go and collect and then fly those animals back to Boston. But they're also in demand in the aquarium world. So we um, had those animals spawn and raise the offspring. And ultimately, we were able to share some of those offspring with 12 other institutions, you know, college, college institu collegial institutions, partner institutions, so that they were able to put that animal on display and similarly not go and collect in the wild. Oh. So other things that we do from a sustainability perspective is we're very quick to adopt technology that does not use a lot of energy, or in other words, that is energy efficient. So uh, LED lights is an obvious example. Yeah. Um, now you can actually grow corals using LED lights, which mm. consume far less energy than traditional lighting for coral exhibits. And we are using DC pumping technology, which replaces the traditional AC pumping technology and it's, uh, it consumes about a fifth of the energy. It's unbelievable, the difference. Not to mention the physical space that yes. it occupies, Uses right? less space, uh, generates less heat, so there are secondary um, energy savings as well. So anything like that, we really try and uh, bring on board very quickly. Uh, then, of course, a lot of the skills that we use in-house, so clinical techniques to uh, care for the animals, we have developed and are now being used out in the field for field conservation biologists. And a lot of uh, standards, standards of practice, for example, uh, have been written up and have become sort of how to care for and uh, manuals that are used by um, other institutions and are used by researchers in the field. And we actually deploy our skills in the field as well. A lot of the animal care team assists the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life scientists with that skill set as well. And then, of course, um, you spoke with Nick uh, yeah. most recently. Yeah. The Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life is doing a lot of work out in the field that is really focused on uh, conservation research that is also focused on solutions. Right. Um, so that, and I think that's a really good lens to look at things. Uh, what can we develop quickly that is actually a solution in the field? So we learn, we educate, we inspire inside the walls, and then we continuously study and research and look for solutions outside of the walls. Absolutely. Sort of how I like to look at it. So I think most people don't appreciate that there's the animal care side of the job, but there's also this incredibly complex operations side, and you have to know how to do both because... You have to understand the uh, environments in which these animals are being 
uh, put and, and cared for. It's, it's really, really remarkable. Really remarkable. So I'm wondering, um, what's been your most uh, sort of challenging experience, or, or maybe more the most exciting experience in your career uh, in animal care? When, <laughs> when, when did you just say, wow, this is, this is really exciting, incredible work? Well, that's a really good question. Um, there are so many examples. I know, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> so, I knew you'd um, say that. <laughs> I'd say one of the most challenging roles that I have ever had, it wasn't actually at the New England Aquarium, it was starting up the Oceanaria de Lisboa, yes. which is Europe's largest aquarium. It's in Lisbon, right? It's yeah. in Lisbon in Portugal. Yeah. It's a fabulous uh, aquarium, it's a partner aquarium with us. Yes. Um, same architect. <laughs> Same yes. architect, exactly. Yes. Yes. Same architect. And um, we really uh, broke the mold on a lot of things when it came to how do you present animals to the public. One example of that was sort of t a leaf taken from the book of the New England Aquarium, which was the penguin exhibit. Um, and that was for our puffin exhibit in Lisbon, uh -huh. where those animals are in the same airspace as the public and actually very close to the public. Oh, interesting. And yeah, that was a really a challenge to try yeah. and work out how we would do that. And also have above water and below water viewing for the same species. And uh, that was, it, it worked so phenomenally well. It was very satisfying to see that whole thing come together. And I had the great fortune also of going to Iceland to collect the puffins. Oh, wow. We went to this little island uh, south of Iceland where there are five million birds nesting every season, and we collected 15 chicks. Oh, that's and, um, just to go and see the animals in their natural habitat helped inform how we would present those animals to the public. And uh, of course, um, since we actually opened that exhibit, there's been a lot of breeding, and so uh, those animals are propagating in the exhibit. Oh, that was a wonderful great. experience. Well, and I'm, I'm certain that that experience then helped inform how we continuously adapt this display and other displays. Absolutely uh, as right. Part of that continuous learning cycle. That exactly, you, and, that you and we develop techniques that we, we don't actually understand how they may ultimately be used in the field, or how you might care for an animal that's been sick or injured. And uh, so, when we did the exhibit in Lisbon. We wrote that information up and made that available to other institutions and, and, and yeah, exactly ex as you said, we're often at the vanguard of how you display animals, how you care for animals and uh, that's just that, that sort of front of information is growing all the time and we're getting uh, better and better and better at it all the time. So I don't know uh, if you can answer this question but do you have a favorite animal <laughs> in, in this aquarium? Wow. I get asked that question all the time, I'll <laughs> give you my answer after you give me yours. Well, I have many. I think, you know, one group of animals that has always been fascinating to me and has mesmerized me are the cephalopods, which are the cuttlefish yeah. and the octopus and the yeah. squid. They are like aliens on Earth. Yeah. So fascinating as, animal, as a group of animals, just brilliant animals. But, you know, I love the sea dragons, I love the penguins, I love the turtles. Yeah. Um, you almost have to yeah, do this work, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you really do. <laughs> you really do. And, and, uh, I've just had the fortune of working quite intimately with almost every animal group at some point in my career and really getting to know them well and understand them and appreciate them. Uh, it's, yeah, it's been wonderful. We have a question. Oh, we do have a question. Okay, so we have a question. Does the aquarium feed sustainable fish to its animals? That is a fabulous question. I know the answer, but I'm going to let the yeah. expert answer. No, so there was a question from Ryan. I, I thank you, Ryan, for the question. Great question. Uh, the answer is yes, and we actually have our sustainable seafood program here, uh, which was predominantly developed initially for uh, human consumption of food, fishes and uh, seafood, and we used the skills developed there to extend to how we source food for the animal collection, and it is sustainably sourced as well. And uh, one of the, one of the uh, team in the Anderson Cabot Centre for Ocean Life did that work, and uh, we've actually helped other institutions do the same thing. So we've used the skills that we learned initially for human food consumption, extrapolated that to animal food consumption, and now that's being deployed uh, more broadly across the uh, zoo and aquarium community. So how about the krill too? That's another facet of this too, right? The krill that we're, that we're growing and feeding. 
to your own? Yeah, we, I mean, we grow, we actually culture exactly a lot of food here. Um, a whole variety of things. Uh, one very obvious one is uh, brine shrimp, artemia, which a lot of our animals consume. So we have a uh, very um, well-structured program. State-of-the-art. Yeah. I mean, like, it's amazing. <laughs> I, I... It is clever, actually. It's, it's, it's almost at a production line level yeah. uh, where we rear the food and uh, it's available continuously to all the people who feed and care for the animals. That's, yeah. that's wonderful. Uh, okay, well, um, I don't think we have any other questions. I have learned so much. <laughs> I learn so much every time I talk with you, Mark. And um, thank you so much for your passion and your commitment to this work. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have.